we bought it we bought it going on six years ago they knew when they sold it they we were going to buy it and they they would have to leave they've had over five years to find another place really doesn't matter whether anybody's worshiping there now or not that's not the point we own the property we've given them five years to relocate at for ten dollars a year i think that's gone i'm uh and we also own the part that abuts that lot which gives us almost twice the uh, property to market could really do something good there on that corner that really needs it. So I'm all in favor of giving them uh, uh, six months notice max and tell them we we need them to leave. Chair, if, yes. if I do want to address something, we need to be consistent with our leases, and this is a lease that is below, way below market. Um, there's a comparable property that I'm aware of. Uh, of similar size that rents for $2,000 in the HOB area. And one of the things that as we're doing a month to month, month to month leases are usually higher than the previous lease. Technically right now, because there is not a lease, technically they're a holdover tenant. But the holdover clause only allows you to do double, okay? Um, I feel that looking at the market, that yes, we need to give a six-month notice, but we need to do a six-month lease uh, locked in at a fair market price or at least a, way above where we're at to be consistent with our other properties that we rent um, because we do have other properties that we rent and we have we increased all of those as well. Well, we made a deal up front, and I think we have to stick with it. And uh, so, but I'm yeah. so I'm all right. Let's just it's not it's the wrong time to go back and change it. Yeah, if I may, um, I I could go along with what the what the uh, the chair is saying. Uh, Hi, Evel, um, are we at a are we hard pressed to uh, to get this property? Uh, in, in terms of, say, a, another month would not make a big difference. No, we're. I'm, okay, I'm recommending here, giving them what, six here's months. Here's what I would like. Here's what I would like to, to have done. Um, I would like to have the opportunity to go with uh, uh, staff or whomever and talk with them, and 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 get that satisfaction because I have to live in that community, Certainly. and I have a heart for churches, uh, as you might imagine, and not saying that that the rest of you don't, but. Uh, I, I would like, because we're not hard pressed, let's just uh, uh, give it another uh, at our next meeting. Make this decision that we're about to make, and give me the opportunity of talk with him, going there, visiting the place, see what's really going on, <coughs> along with with Mike or, or whomever. Uh, would that be acceptable to this this board? Well, well it's not acceptable to me. No, and let me tell you me. why. Well, wait okay. a minute. Let's one at one a time. time. One time. It's not acceptable to me because I, it's been five years. It's not like we're all of a sudden going to tell them to go away. They sold it to us. They took the money. They said, three hundred thousand. great, you can have our place, and, and, we'll, and we'll leave. But we've left them sit there for five years. Now, it is, it is important to me to get that property up and, and move it and get something developed there. I don't want to wait another year or something to make it happen. Well, I need I'm something needs to happen there or not. One month. One month. You're talking less well, than, you mean one month instead of six months? One, one month. We, this decision that we're about to make tonight. I, I hear what you're of, saying. I hear what you're yeah, saying, but, but you're I don't can't envision anything that he will tell you that will change my mind. But I'll just put that out front. But go ahead. Mr. I Parker. concur with you, Mayor. Um, he has six months, and with all due respect to this gentleman and to you, uh, um, uh, Vice Mayor Hay, he has six months. So basically, you're going to find out. But what I what I believe is we're. One way or the other, the property is going to be ours, and it's ours, so he has six months to do whatever he has to do, and you're giving him all the respect there is by giving him the six months. So I concur with the mayor. He's had plenty of time. Uh, he has the money. He's paying very, very little rent, and sometimes, unfortunately, you have to push people because they take advantage of you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, I'd like to suggest a sort of compromise on the situation. I'd like to suggest that we, in essence, table this for a month, give uh, uh, Vice Chair Hay the opportunity to do his investigation. If he comes back next month with the result we, we sort of anticipate, uh, then we proceed with this and give them five months' notice instead of six. 
so the total time remains the same, but there is the possibility it would change depending on and gives Vice Chair Hay the opportunity to uh, do his investigation. I can live with that as long as you change the five months if you come back a month later. No, I don't have a problem that way. I don't have you any problem with that either. No. Okay. And, and Chair, some good news is that we have had some development inquiries on that land okay. from major companies. And hopefully, if that can be rekindled, um, it would be a very positive impact for that corner. Is there a motion to me, table this? Can I make one other statement? Yes. Um, not that you have to on, on every piece of property that you discuss like this, but when, when you can, um, get the uh, commissioner of that particular district involved uh, so that we will be abreast on what the details are and what's going on. Uh, I, I think, as was stated by uh, board member uh, Fritz Patrick, that uh, we, we, we do have to think uh, in terms of the district that we were elect elected by, even though we are board members and commissioners for the entire city. But when, when it's possible, okay, get us involved uh, in, in whatever area we will uh, yes, sir. Impact. That, yes, sir. That's why we reached out to you last. Yes, we, we tried to do that at this time. So. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to table this for one month? Uh, and motion let, to table. Let Mr. Second. Hay do what we suggested. I have a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Show the motion. No. Is. I oppose. I, okay. don't wanna, I think it's a matter of semantics. We're playing with words. Five months, six months. We're giving them six months. It's simple to the point, and I believe that Commissioner Hay is doing it one way or the other, the same thing, speaking to the gentleman. So show the, I vote no. Show the motion passes six to one. Okay, quarterly report from Stage Left Theater. Any questions on that one? Hearing none, we'll go to new business. Presentation by Kim Delaney of the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council regarding the FEC commuter rail project. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this evening. Uh, my name is Kim Delaney, and I'm with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, and also here on behalf of the Palm Beach MPO. So thanks to uh, uh, Vice Mayor Hay, who uh, has enabled us to provide planning assistance to local governments through the agreement we have with them. Um, and uh, what I have for you tonight is a bit of an overview of um, the rail projects that are coming into the region. There's been some reference tonight um, to commuter rail on the FEC, so I'll try to cover that for you if I can, um, as well as some of the land use considerations that go along with really positioning the city to be able to participate um, in um, the commuter rail service that's coming down the pike. Um, and so with that, kind of the overriding question that we look at as a planning council is, why should I concern myself about the relationship between transportation and land use? How do those things um, work together or work at odds with one another? Um, and what we see are national statistics that look at the southeast Florida region that are frankly not very favorable. Um, the Tans Texas Transportation Institute, the TTI, um, is associated with uh, um, the uh, uh, University of Texas, um, and it assembles congestion data nationwide. Um, and what it finds is that Southeast Florida is kind of award-winning. We have the seventh worst congestion in the United <laughs> States. Um, and that's beyond the typical congestion you would have. Like the commute time it takes to live in Boynton and work in Fort Lauderdale, for example, is X amount of time, 40 minutes. This is on top of the 40 minutes, let's say, the additional congestion to have because the roadway network is just so constrained. What that means is we waste a lot of time and money sitting in traffic that could otherwise be productive capital for the region um, and improve our quality of life. Um, and so I-95, for example, as we know, is the most dangerous roadway in the U.S. It's earned that reputation with a lot of work over time. Um, and so things like looking at transportation and land use together are ways to mitigate those bad conditions and make them better. Um, in jest, um, the I-95 interstate improvement plan um, doesn't really provide a lot of congestion relief. It creates more room when those lanes open up again after construction. All the cars that were diverted away from I-95 while it was under construction fill it up usually within the first week to 10 days. Um, and we have the same condition, which is a constrained roadway condition that really limits economic qualities um, in the region as well as quality of life. We know that the population in the state is forecast to grow considerably over time, and we've had a, uh, a, bit of a, um, a bit of a slowdown in growth as the economic conditions have moderated over the past couple of years, but um, these forecasts are actually the state's adopted forecasts 
for long-term growth in, um, in the state of Florida. Um, and what we find is we're looking at maybe about a 20 million person increase uh, through 2035. The state also knows, and these are actually images from the state's transportation plan, that we have some conditions with the roadway network that are pretty hard for us to build our way out of. This map actually illustrates the state's roadway network as it existed in 2009. That was the most recent picture the state took of how things looked. And all of those corridors that are identified in green are corridors where there was so much congestion already and such a limitation on space, those roadways are considered already expanded to their capacity and they will exist in a constrained condition going forward. What the state learned in that analysis is that by 2035, essentially the entire state roadway network is going to be in a condition of constraint. We just don't have enough real estate to widen the roadways enough to move all the cars when they want to move. And what that's done is really shift the state's focus to transit, because if we're going to give people choices in ways to move, transit and alternative modes are one of the ways that can be, um, that can be added to the network, if you will. When we try to understand why the roads are so crowded then, what we look at, and this map, I realize this is a little tough to read, I apologize for that. What we know is that um, vehicles mile, vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, is a way that um, roadway movement is measured. And that's how many people are um, moving on the roadway at a given point in time. The land use patterns that we have been adopting over the past 20 years have actually made those conditions worse. So instead of the average individual in southeast Florida, for example, um, spending about nine trips per day on the roadway network, now they're spending about 11 trips per day because the roadway, the roadway has to serve uses that are further apart and more disconnected. Um, and so land use, again, becomes a very big part of the equation to be able to move people more freely around the region, around the city of Boynton, um, and through the state. And we know also that the roadway forecast, specifically in southeast Florida, um, is one that gives you a moment of pause, let's say. Uh, this, this quote is from Jim Wolf, who's the secretary of District 4 uh, for the Department of Transportation. And what he is quick to tell you is he has about a quarter of the money he needs to build 100% of the roadway capacity necessary to build, to build for the population that's forecast for the region. Um, if, you, if you take that to another, another level of statistics, what you find is that we have about an 80% population increase of drivers coming to the region in the next 20 years. The roadway network will expand about 42%. So we'll have twice as many people coming for, less, for about half the amount of roadway capacity. So again, that really drives the Regional Planning Council like ours to look at what are the alternatives to that? If that's not a condition that we want and that's not consistent with the visions in communities, what can we do otherwise, again, to maintain mobility um, and to maintain economic quality? Um, so how will we settle the next 10 or 20 million Floridians um, is really the policy question. And what the council would suggest is we're already well into a paradigm shift at this point. There are lots of reasons why transit alternatives and transit and land use have become very high priorities in local governments. Um, we know that the current condition doesn't give us a lot of <laughs> predictability. Um, we do a lot of interview work as a regional planning council in, in speaking to business owners to understand, you know, what are they First dealing board. with in their communities. <laughs> so there are other versions of this slide, but I didn't think they were appropriate. Um, so <laughs> <That's good. laughs> you're welcome for that. Um, so what we find, what we find is that, uh, for example, when gas went to four dollars the last time in 2008. Um, 2009, rather, we were doing interviews of folks that owned um, small businesses in Palm Beach Gardens. We were doing some work there. So the owners of the Dunkin' Donuts, the owners of the little, um, of the Marriott Hotel that have shift employees, and the owners of some small businesses. They were telling us they were putting $25 gas cards in paychecks so their employees could get to work and back. Um, that's an unpredictable condition that we have when that's the only way for those folks to get back and forth in a reasonable manner. Um, the other question that we ask ourselves is whether or not green is on the agenda. And a lot of local governments, and, and Boynton Beach is a leader in this, um, have really embraced the idea of green alternatives um, for future conditions. What we know is that from a carbon footprint perspective, the largest contributor to carbon emissions is single occupant vehicles sitting in traffic on the roadway network. So if we want to really get to that um, uh, source of part of the problem of, um, of uh, climate change and other conditions, Transit is a good way at least to consider how we might move a little differently and reduce some of those impacts. Um, the other thing that we know in looking at national data is that transit gives the most direct return, the most direct leverage for transportation investments. You get about an eight to one return for transit investments 
versus increased productivity, reduced fuel consumption, land values, and reduced roadway construction costs. So we know as dollars have become more limited, there's, a, there's an efficiency consideration that comes along with transit that makes it very attractive for local governments and for the state um, in building towards the future. <clears throat> for the years leading up to the real estate adjustment, um, there was a lot of national data about the increased value of transit-oriented development and all types of uses, residential, both single-family and owner-occupied, um, single-family and multifamily, rather, rental and owner-occupied, retail use, um, uh, retail use, uh, office use, and even some institutional users, where the value of the property that was within a half mile of transit increased considerably versus that same use more than a half mile from transit. Those headlines have continued through the adjustment, and the most recent data tells us that in the last five years, those same uses around transit nodes are worth on average 42% more um, than the same use that's more than a half mile from transit. Um, and so that trend we would expect would continue. The data that's the most recent data, this was actually just published last month, this latest report, came from the American Association of Realtors, um, who certainly have a vested interest in looking at return on those um, investment dollars. Um, and what we find is that um, the number one premium now is a transit premium, and then we're starting to see that in every region of the U.S. Um, so it's an eye-opener when this type of data um, becomes published. When we zoom out of the Treasure Coast region and we try to understand what's happening in competitive regions, what we find is that the competitive regions that we look to have successful and expanding transit networks. If biotech is our goal, and I'll just use that as kind of a mom and apple pie industry cluster that every community seems to want. When you look at biotech clusters around this country, what you find is all those regions have great transit networks. So there are choices, there are alternatives in how you might want to get back and forth to work and, um, and other destinations. When we zoom out further and we look at the states that Florida has said, these are our competitors. We are competing with Texas for certain types of jobs. We're competing with certain states in the Northeast, certain states on the West Coast. What we find is that they all have very extensive and expanding transit networks um, that are very different than what Florida's pattern of investment has been. Um, and when you zoom out even further and you look around the globe at all the major competitors for GDP, what you find is that 60 to 75 percent of all transportation dollars in the competitive nations that we look to are invested in transit networks. We're up to almost 3 percent now nationally. <laughs> so there's a reason why we have a different condition. Uh, but it's a policy question that actually ranges from federal decisions to local land use decisions that makes those networks either competitive and viable or not. Um, and so um, one of the land use considerations that goes, goes along with transit is called transit-oriented development. Um, transit-oriented development is a pattern of land use that really focuses on pedestrian connections. Every transit trip starts and stops as a pedestrian. You're always walking to get on the bus or the train, and when you get to your destination, usually the train station isn't your destination. Usually it's somewhere else. So you always make um, that last, um, they talk about the last mile of the, of the trip is always the focus for capturing land use um, and capturing ridership. Um, that, again, leverages those transportation dollars. Um, TOD tends to be characterized um, in a way that looks fairly urban. Um, Boynton Beach has a great pattern of land use that's been redeveloping over time. That's a TOD-type pattern. It's comfortable to walk from place to place. The further you can walk, the more ridership you can gain on a transit service. It's kind of a kind of a simple analogy, right? Um, uh, the other consideration is parking isn't the most dominant feature on a site. Um, so a TOD site would tend to have the building first and the parking behind it or parking structured. Um, <coughs> pardon me. But um, uh, there is a difference between transit-oriented development and then we'll say his evil twin, Ta Todd's evil twin brother, Tad, transit-adjacent development. Just because there's a lot of stuff built around the transit station doesn't mean you've done anything to improve ridership or leverage that investment, right? So if there's, um, if unfortunately you take today's tri-rail corridor and you look at much of the development that exists along the CSX, much of that is not transit-oriented. It simply happens to be development that was there before tri-rail was ever put on the CSX. That said, with that woeful land use pattern, which is how it's looked at when you measure the statistics, tri-rail is carrying 16,000 people a day because that mobility source is so needed. 20,000 is a full lane of traffic on 95, just to give you a matter of perspective. So almost a full lane of traffic is traveling on tri-rail and not traveling on I-95 for the AM, PM peak hours. 
Um, so there is a distinction between transit-oriented development that happens on purpose um, and transit-adjacent development, let's say. Just because you build a lot of stuff by a train station or by a bus node doesn't mean you do anything to affect ridership or really take advantage of the property value leverage that comes from having a new mode of transportation. Um, there are some particular features that go along with TOD, and I won't spend much time on these. We've been working with your staff and all the cities in the region on understanding the characteristics, but there has to be suitability. There is a system of streets and blocks that adds up to make a walkable place. Um, it does have a very high focus on pedestrian comfort. Active uses on a ground floor, for example, are a lot more comfortable to pedestrians than a blank wall or a parking lot. So when you, when you, uh, when you plan those things, you add up to make a better place. Um, TOD does have a good mix of buildings and uses. Um, it tends to have about 18 hours of activity. So if you can imagine, you've got residential where people are walking their dogs at 6 a.m. By 8 a.m., you're on your way to work. Uh, the offices are occupied from, let's say, 9 to 6. After hours, you're eating dinner on the street. You've still got eyes on the street till 7, 8, 9 o'clock. 10, 11, midnight, you're walking your dog the last time, and then the neighborhood kind of closes down. That mix of activity creates for natural – it's if you have a late dog, Commissioner. Um, if you, uh, if you, uh, that mix of activity um, uh, tends to create natural surveillance. Um, and so that positive activity actually creates for safer spaces. Uh, there is building design and placement that happens carefully. Again, buildings are positioned so the street becomes comfortable for pedestrians as well as other users, but certainly for pedestrians as a primary user along the street frontage. Again, parking is placed and treated in a way that doesn't dominate a site, but rather parking is somewhat controlled. Um, and then there are additional considerations, civic and cultural spaces, public open spaces, um, and tying in with other transit modes. Uh, there is some state leadership from the Department of Transportation on the subject of TOD. Uh, we just completed a two-year project for the state and um, uh, assisted the state in publishing what's called a guidebook for TOD. Your staff is aware of that document and has it to utilize. We're happy to assist if there are questions about how that document gets implemented. What it does is try to standardize some of the definitions and the terminology. Um, what's really impressive about it is it's FDOT providing some leadership on land use so that those DOT investments actually become more efficient and they're used um, in a way that contributes to economic outcome. Um, when you add those things up and you look at what's an existing TOD look like, if you're familiar with downtown Winter Park, that little circle is the Amtrak station that's quickly getting ready to become a SunRail commuter station in downtown Winter Park. Uh, there's a line of buildings that fronts um, Park Avenue uh, that has a mix of um, Mix of uses, parking is not dominating the street, it has 18 hours of activity, pedestrians are very comfortable. That's kind of a classic TOD relationship. Um, we do have the other kind of relationship. This happens to be the Pompano Beach Tri-Rail Station. Um, it's a good opportunity for infill development. What you see is the uh, parking, uh, the uh, circle there is around the Tri-Rail Station and it's pretty well separated from everything around it. Um, in fact, you have to cross a moat or jump the fence to get to this office building over here. <laughs> Um, so there are certainly ways to uh, redevelop opportunities like this to, again, make them more efficient. Um, we have a transportation system there waiting for uh, the appropriate land use to, to come in. There is not a one-size-fits-all when it comes to TOD, um, and, and, and the council always stresses the importance of this point. Uh, Grand Central Station has a place and a scale that makes sense for Grand Central Station. Um, that's probably not the city of Boynton Beach. Um, there are town center uses that make sense that are maybe two to six stories, two to eight stories. They have an appropriate place in the region. There are very neighborhood scale places as well. If you get north in the region to the town of Jupiter, let's say, um, there are different types of TOD that work in different places. Um, and so again, there isn't a one size fits all, um, but TOD has to respond to the context of the place. Um, there's also not a one size fits all when it comes to the type of transportation service that functions in a transit network. So we have tri-rail, for example, which is, um, which is commuter rail, and hopefully we'll have a future tri-rail coastal service that will come right up the FEC and provide a station in Boynton Beach. There's also high-speed rail. There's intercity passenger rail like Amtrak. And then there's a whole range of local services that also correspond to land use patterns, local and regional bus service and bus rapid transit, two of the types of things we're likely to see in the region um, in the next uh, five to ten years. So that said, why is the state into this conversation as heavily as it is? When you look around the state of Florida, what you find are major rail projects either in the ground or on the horizon, essentially in every urban portion of the state of Florida. 
Um, in the southeast Florida region, what we have um, is a couple of services on the ground and some coming. I'll touch on each of those in just a, um, just a moment as we walk through the slide, if that's okay. Uh, questions? I'm sorry. Was there a question? Can I keep, keep, Go ahead. keep going? All right, I'll keep going. So I'm not highly caffeinated, so I can take a break if needed. So. But otherwise. <laughs> How much so, longer do you have? Sorry? How much longer do you have? I've got six slides. Okay. So that's Great. about four Thanks. minutes for me usually. So, um, so uh, uh, that purple line is the Amtrak service that exists today in the state of Florida. It carries about a million people a year in the state of Florida. Um, also uh, coming uh, down the coast is FEC Amtrak service, which is uh, Amtrak extending on the FEC corridor from Jacksonville down the coast to West Palm Beach, crossing over and then coming down the uh, CSX, where those Amtrak stations currently are, into Miami International Airport. We have today's existing tri-rail service. carries, uh, uh, again, about 16,000 people along 72 miles. It has 18 stations, including one on Gateway. And then on the FEC corridor, there's two types of services that are on the horizon. One is the extension of tri-rail, um, to be called the tri-rail coastal link. And the second is a new model, uh, which the, no one in the country has ever seen. Florida's kind of a pioneer in this. And that is what's called um, FECI, Florida East Coast Industries All Aboard Florida Service. That's Express Intercity Passenger Service with just three stations in the southeast, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm. Four stations going to be at Orlando International Airport. Ultimately, that service will be extended to both Tampa and Jacksonville. Um, FECI's project is the first set of trains we'll see on the FEC that won't be carrying rocks but carrying people, I would forecast for you. Um, this is a $1.5 billion project. FECI has proposed, uh, they introduced the project in May of last year. Um, it is a purely private project. It is moving very quickly. Um, uh, FECI has already finished the environmental work from West Palm to Miami, and it's beginning the environmental work from West Palm to Orlando now. Um, it's our understanding they would likely be under construction by the end of next year, and service would be operational in 2015. Um, they'll be adding a second track in the corridor um, and just three stations again in the region. Uh, nine acres of property FECI owns in downtown Miami. Uh, the station location in Fort Lauderdale is still under some discussion, but somewhere around the downtown Fort Lauderdale area. Um, and then in West Palm Beach, uh, FEC has already purchased a couple of properties around Daytura and Avernia. So if you know that part of West Palm, it's kind of splitting the difference between City Place and Clematis Street. Um, so again, this project would likely be operational around 2015. They'll be running 16 trains a day in each direction, so it'll be 32 trains a day in all. They'll be um, fairly fast, going up to 79 miles an hour, let's say, through West Palm, uh, maybe 90 miles an hour in the northern part of the region, and then about 125 from Cocoa to Orlando. Uh, FECI is negotiating with the state to acquire part of the 528 corridor, which is the Beach Line Expressway running between Cocoa and uh, Orlando as of right now. Um, so I imagine you'll be seeing some information about this coming through, uh, coming through the, your staff, um, as well as in dialogue at uh, the League of Cities. Um, the, I mentioned to you the Amtrak FEC corridor project. Um, this project may happen simultaneously with the FECI project. This is Amtrak service extending on the FEC um, with eight new stations, St. Augustine, Daytona, um, Titusville, Cocoa, Melbourne, Vera Beach, Fort Pierce, and Stewart. Um, those trains would then cross over in West Palm and continue to provide service to Amtrak's existing stations that are over on the CSX, ending up in Miami International Airport. As I mentioned, Tri-Rail today carries about 16,000 people a day. Um, and what's coming next, likely, um, and uh, Commissioner Hay, Vice Mayor Hay may, may have more to add, um, would be Tri-Rail's new service that would be extended on the, F on the FEC corridor. Uh, that service is called Tri-Rail's Coastal Link. Um, there are three segments of that service. Tri -rail -like service existing Tri-Rail service is identified in the black. That service would be extended north in West Palm Beach across a new connection, north to Jupiter, the northernmost station being around Tony Pena Drive, which is Jupiter Medical Center. That service would be extended across in Pompano, a new rail connection, and then south on the FEC into downtown Miami, the terminal station being all aboard Florida's terminal station, which is uh, Miami's government center. Um, and then a new layer of service, which would be more of a local service, and you see that highlighted in the green, uh, and that would include a station right in Boynton Beach. And I have an illustration of the recommended location for you in just a moment. Um, as of this point, this package of services will come to the MPO uh, for a, um, an endorsement to move ahead probably sometime this summer. Um, all three of those segments are likely to move ahead at the same time into the environmental process, and then it will be a local discussion about funding. 
Uh, there will be a local funding contribution that will be expected um, from the communities that receive those stations. And so that will be a subject of continuing discussion over time. Um, but this one, is, um, uh, this one is likely lined up probably in about five to six years implementation time frame. Could move faster if the FEC and the state have a good conversation as they get into negotiations. But that would be my guess for you. So going on. Um, in terms of station locations, um, in the city of Boynton Beach, uh, FDOT and the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority, which runs TriRail, has been working with all the local governments to help identify station locations. Uh, in the city of Boynton Beach, um, uh, east-west roads, just a matter of context, uh, Boynton Beach Boulevard and then Ocean Avenue to the south, uh, Gateway Boulevard and Dixie Highway. Um, the red dotted line is the FEC corridor. The station location would be a little south of uh, Boynton Beach Boulevard, most likely just north of Ocean. Um, from a planning consideration, uh, the immediate impact would be that quarter mile radius, the transit oriented development um, considerations that you may have as a, um, um, as a, as a governing board. Um, the 125 acres that lies in that quarter mile would have likely the, 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 the greatest focus and the immediate impact, but also as you get out a half mile, um, again, when we look around the country, what we find is that the land use impacts extend all the way a half mile out from the station in the immediate context um, for a focus on those transit-oriented characteristics, if you will, mix of uses, pedestrian orientation, um, densities and intensities that are appropriate for your community, and also the values that come back to the city as a result of that. Um, so, um, so this station location is one that's been uh, carried forward for quite some time. Um, and uh, again, likely coming to the MPO for further action this summer sometime um, as part of the package moving forward. Um, the location isn't set in stone, but seems to make sense versus the spacing from other locations and the things that the city has in its, um, in its planning documents. Um, so the question for the city is what will the city's future be? Um, the city has um, a lot of decisions that will come to it in the coming uh, months um, and um, over the next year or so. Very focused on land use, though. Um, as a core part of the conversation uh, to, uh, to, again, leverage that investment. So with that, I would suggest to you, likely if you're on 995, expect to be tr beaten by the train again today. Um, a friend of mine drew this illustration. I couldn't, uh, couldn't resist putting it up. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Any questions from the board? Just one, uh, Kim. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, I thought there were – well, let me ask the question. Are there funds to do the first option, which is the most direct, rather than the crossing over and going up? What, wasn't there a federal program of some kind here recently in the last few months or so or um, that would allow me, building that most direct route? Um, let's, uh, let me see if I understand your question, uh, sir. Back on the uh, one where you had the three maps. Uh, that's where I'm at. So um, this, uh, I believe you're referring to this service? Right. Right. Okay. So, um, so the, the status with respect to kind of this master plan, if you will, is that the state and the MPO and the RTA that runs TriRail have been trying to package this project um, and get it submitted for federal funding consideration. That's in motion now. Um, the MPO will um, likely receive a request to endorse that action, if you will, sometime this summer. Um, and then this package, all three of those colors, green, yellow, and red, including Boynton Beach's station, is my, my expectation. All th that whole service package will go into the federal application process um, for funding. Um, uh, we have probably about 18 months of work to do in that process, finish, fine-tune the station locations. Part of that action also will be local discussions about funding, and that's one of the conversations the MPO board is just starting to have. There's a local funding conversation for each community to work through um, because there's, um, yeah, there will ultimately be some type of additional funds necessary to operate and maintain that service, um, and each community individually will have an opportunity to kind of think through what makes sense for individual communities and how those communities might participate in that. <coughs> There's still quite a bit of work to do yet in understanding all the pieces. One Thank last you. question. Okay. Do, do you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, my, my thing is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu? Often, yes. Uh, who's at the table for us in uh, terms of uh, Borton Beach and, and, the, and the county? The, the Palm Beach MPO is at the table. The Regional Planning Council is at the table as well. But that was a question the last time. Yep. 
uh, that, that we had the meeting, mm -hmm. that there was some uncertainty uh, on, on the part of who was representing who. Understand. Um, uh, we, have, we have been asked to play many roles. The MPO staff, as you know, is somewhat limited. Um, and so we have been asked at times to represent the MPO in those station discussions and um, um, station location evaluations, if you will. Uh, the Palm Beach MPO has also been engaged in all of those discussions. Okay. Um, and so the city has double representation, if you will, both agencies. Um, there aren't a lot of bodies. Um, but those agencies are both actively engaged in the discussions as they go forward. The Palm Beach, the voting will actually come back to the Palm Beach MPO to okay. actually allocate funds. So there's, there is, um, um, there are funding decisions to be made by the MPO boards before the project moves forward. Regional Planning Council is a facilitator. This is good for the region. That's my board's position. Um, okay. Mobility is good, right. but those funding board. decisions will be the MPO board itself. Do you yep. have a question? Thank you. Sure. No? I, you I have one yeah. question. Uh, on the CRA um, map or the conceptual map where it showed this, it, the uh, uh, train station was only on the east side of the track. If it's double track, isn't it going to have to be a station on or a platform on both north and southbound? Yeah, there will be platforms on both sides. Um, and the station locations have all um, – have all been focused in places where we have a grade crossing, so we don't have to go up, over, and down. Nobody really likes to do that at the tri-rail stations. And so pretty much in every station along the corridor, with few exceptions, the stations are located at existing grade crossings, so that there would be platforms on the east and west sides. Um, there could be parking on the east side and station activity, or there could be, could be on the west side. It depends what property becomes available. The, the tri-rail station at uh, the gateway, is that kind of, would that be a similar model uh, set up with like the, a, a loop for dropping passengers off in a parking area, or would it be not, not just depending on, on uh, uh, walking passengers within a half mile? Um, the, um, the expectation is that these stations along the FEC are going to have a lot more pedestrian access and much more development taking place around them because that's the pattern of development that we have to work with on the FEC. The, the existing stations along Tri-Rail were developed in the late 1980s under a very suburban model, um, and the presumption was at the time folks would have to either drive or take the bus to get to the Tri-Rail station and then get on Tri-Rail and you know, avoid I-95 and make their trip that way. And that's exactly what happens for the most part. And that's the land use condition that we had, and it's the land use condition that we tend to continue to have along most of the corridor. The FEC is a completely different corridor from a land use perspective. There's a lot more bodies and jobs that are near those stations and along that corridor, which is one of the reasons why it's so very competitive for transit service. So if I were to suggest a model to you, um, I, I, I would suggest the station at Boynton Beach would have much less parking, more parking would be integrated into other uses that would be occurring there, and that parking becomes a flex, uh, a flex parking, so the same space gets used 24 hours, for example, which is a more efficient model. Um, okay. The station, physical station itself, could be integrated into a, a mixed-use building, or it could be a standalone. That's going to be one of the decisions that your board and the city commission will make. Um, but there are much, there's much more flexibility about how those stations will physically be located on the ground. Again, because the land use conditions are frankly so much better for transit along the FEC. Mr. Mayor? Thank you. Yes. Sure. I have one quick question. Uh, what do you consider the feasibility of these projects if there is little to zero federal funding? Um, without any federal funding, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, um, the, the project actually could be funded just by the state and locals. Um, it's a higher ticket, obviously. There's a higher price tag to that. There is a cost to going through the federal process. There's a length of time necessary, and there's a lot more environmental work to secure federal dollars. Um, there has been discussion about the project being funded with just state and local dollars. Um, it how, how about a, private money? I mean, you said that one uh, piece is uh, being funded privately now. Yes. So it's projected this would be profitable enough that private funding could carry the whole thing? No, it's a different type of service. I mean, what we know in looking at transportation systems um, is that virtually every piece of the transportation network takes a subsidy at some level to build it, right, capital dollars, and then takes a subsidy to operate it and maintain it. That, that's true for a bike lane, a sidewalk, airports and seaports, transit and roadways, all of it. The FEC 
um, intercity service is very unique. Uh, there's a reason why there hasn't been another project like this in the country, because there aren't two bookends for that type of service. It is Miami and Orlando that is traffic fueled by South American and European travelers. Um, and what FEC has done in analyzing its market, and, and I've read FEC's documents, so I know them as well as I can, and, and they would certainly be able to give you a much more informed position. Um, but as we've read them, what we understand is they're forecasting of the 50 million travelers today uh, on an annual basis that travel between Miami and Orlando, if they pick up like a half a percent, they actually can make their project work. Um, they're directly competing with regional airfare, regional airlines, and they'll be able to produce um, a connection between those two ends at a time rate that's comparable to air travel, but at a cost that's slightly lower. Um, and again, by focusing on European and South American travelers that are accustomed to train travel, their numbers show pretty good, pretty good confidence that they could take a family from Brazil, let's say, that's going into Miami for a week and add on to that trip a weekend at the theme parks. Um, and so that train service makes that connection in a unique way. Trains going 80, 90, 110, 125 miles an hour during certain portions is a unique travel mode. And there's a, there's a disadvantage to traveling by regional airways that folks don't like sometimes. And so this directly goes at that market. Uh, the other part of their market are business Okay, his travelers. question was just about funding, though. I think no. we got that. Sorry. Thank okay. you. Uh, any just, other questions? Just a quick comment. I'm uh, more caffeinated yeah, than I yeah, thought. Yeah. I, I think this would, be, if this does come to be, this would be a great uh, piece of the puzzle to our uh, downtown area. What could be better than that with the, the project we discussed earlier uh, this evening, the train station uh, almost right across the street from it, and it would be just wonderful. Right. Absolutely. I think that's our goal is to get the station here. So we really appreciate all the input. We thank you. A very, very uh, definitive uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, the next item is the uh, CRA Board Workshop sponsored by the Florida Redevelopment Association. I just would like to uh, encourage all of us to attend that. I can tell you it's, um, it's uh, the Florida Redevelopment Association, an organization that represents the CRAs throughout the state of Florida. One of the FRA's functions is to provide training to elected officials, board members, and CRA staff so that they may become familiar with Florida State Statute 163.3 that governs the CRA and best practices of redevelopment. This is the first time the FRA is offering the board training in Palm Beach County area. The course to cover the basic rules of, for board members, laws pertaining to expenditures, reporting requirements, and more. The meeting is held on Saturday, May 18th at the Doubletree Hotel on PJ Boulevard for a half day. That is a fast and easy way to get up to speed on being a CRA board member. So I think that really, uh, and at the, the, it's $45 per board member, which I assume the CRA of would course. pick up the cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, chair. Any questions about it? Yes, Chair. Yes. If I may, I make, um, myself, Mr., uh, Mr. Buchanan, and uh, Vice Chair Hay went through this two years ago at the FRA conference in um, Orlando and found it very beneficial and it gives you a different perspective and it gives you um, the other thing is you're able to um, be there with other people from other markets and so you can listen and share ideas and that type of thing so I would highly encourage also I, I'm planning on attending just as a refresher because it has been two years since I went to the last one and I agree with Chair uh, Taylor that it is it, it is very beneficial. It gives you kind of a do's and don'ts, um, and it's very productive. So if you have planned to attend, please let uh, yes, our let executive know, director know so, so I can, can schedule you, sign you up and schedule you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Executive director's report. You have anything, Vivian? Um, if you any, have any questions, it's, we always put it in the backup. It's all back up there on so the different uh, things. Any questions. And the tree lights, uh, thank you, Mike, um, <laughs> for all your hard work on that. Uh, the night of the movie night, we got to see them in, in action, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's really helping the avenue. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback on the lanterns. Uh, from different people at, that, uh, at the Little House and other places. And it's really something that um, su Sunday in the Park, people were talking about it because they hadn't seen it before. And once again, I know how hard you worked <laughs> on that. 
And like I said, it looked easy on paper, but in reality, it was okay. pretty tricky. So thank you. All right. You. For uh, just for the public's notice, our future agenda items are responses to the RFP for 211 East Ocean. It'll happen on May 14th. Uh, set a date for the budget meeting, which is May 14th. RFQ for professional services, May 14th. RFQ for insurance brokerage services, May 14th, and consideration of amending economic development programs on May 14th. So all those are coming up at the May 14th meeting. Hearing nothing, if there's no other business, we stand adjourned.